a European patent application that shows a potential iPhone implementation with both facial and fingerprint biometric identity scanners is making the rounds and is prompting a lot of goofy bad headlines, but also giving us a glimpse into what I really do think is the inevitable future of iPhone security. Spoiler. It's not quote unquote getting Touch ID back, at least not in the conventional sense. Touch ID is the past. Apple burned that boat behind them to make sure everyone on every team had no choice and no fallback but to make Face ID work. But Face ID isn't the future either, it's simply the present. Touch ID was faster and more convenient than passcode. Face ID feels almost transparent, like no authentication at all. There are a few times though, when your finger moisture has changed or you're wearing gloves or the sun is behind you at just the wrong angle or you're wearing ski gear where it just works, just stops working. It's not often, but it's often enough to shatter the illusion and make you want something even faster than Touch ID and even more transparent than Face ID. To make you want the future of persistent, passive, biometric authentication. I'm Rene Ritchie, welcome back to Vector. So great to see you all again. Let's break this down. Imagine a future iPhone where authentication doesn't require a specific fingerprint or facial geometry scan or biometric challenge response model at all. Instead, imagine a system that's continuously grabbing snippets of a wide range of biometric data. And imagine it would use that data to maintain a threshold of trust where your iPhone is simply unlocked for as long as it can be reasonably or strictly, depending on your settings, certain it's in your possession, challenging only when trust falls below that threshold. Other vendors are already incorporating Touch ID-like sensors beneath the capacitive displays, rather than as discrete surfaces on the front, side, or back. There are also patents for micro LCD technology that further enhances screen as fingerprint reader. In the future, certain areas, or even the entire display itself, could be able to pull partial fingerprint data every time you touch it. Face ID has been doing full face geometry scans with neural engine processing to unlock since iPhone 10. It seems almost trivial that the true depth camera could grab at least partial facial geometry each and every time you look at the screen. Siri began doing the basics of voice ID a couple of years ago. Now, when you use Setup Buddy on a new device, it has you say a few simple phrases so it can distinguish your voice and your voice queries and commands from those of others. I don't think it's robust enough for authentication yet, but companies like Nuance have been offering just exactly those kinds of my voice is my passport, authorize me services for a while. It's not tough to see Apple using the multiple beam forming mics on iPhones and AirPods to constantly match snippets of your voice either. Apple's A series processors also contain integrated M series sensor fusion hubs. Right now that's used for things like health and fitness apps and games. Taken further though, gait analysis could be used to record and check your walking and motion patterns. So as you move around, your iPhone can know it's actually you that's doing the moving. Biometric data could also be supplemented by other factors like trusted objects. Previously, trusted objects were dumb. If you grabbed someone else's dongle, you got right into their phone. With Apple Watch though, trusted objects got smarter. Auto unlock on macOS, which uses the proximity of your Apple Watch and time of flight to authenticate you for your Mac, feels downright magical, especially when you consider that your Apple Watch could have been unlocked by Touch ID or Face ID on your iPhone, and that's quite the projected chain of trust. Location data could also be counted towards the threshold as well. Reminders already use geofences for our to-dos. A security system could use them to see if where you are matches typical behavioral patterns and then increase or decrease the trust level accordingly. Taken separately, each of these authentication methods or weightings either require user action or don't provide enough security to be useful. Taken together though, every touch of the display provides a partial print. Every glance at the camera provides a partial face or iris scan. Every word a partial voice print. Every step a partial gait analysis. And if a paired Apple Watch is proximate and you're in a place at a time that fits your patterns, enough factors pass authentication and the moment your iPhone senses any engagement, any engagement at all, it's already unlocked and ready to be of service. Conversely, anytime enough factors fail authentication, your phone goes into lockdown and challenges you for a proper fingerprint, full facial geometry scan, or passcode or password to make sure you really are you. And it could escalate for situations that warrant it. 
That's what happens today, for example, after a reboot, a timeout, or software update. For secure enterprise or government use, it could do so more often and require multiple factors to resume a trusted state. We'll likely need considerable advances in battery chemistry and power management, and strict adherence to privacy policies to enable this kind of technology. But Apple is uniquely positioned to deliver both. Just like chipsets, Apple doesn't have to worry about acting like a component supplier for other vendors. And unlike data harvesting companies, Apple doesn't want or need to store or exploit any of the personal information this type of security could very easily easily surface. Instead, it could all happen on device, hardware encrypted, built privately and securely from the start, from the silicon to the sensors. It's also likely to require entirely new types of machine learning models to crunch and compare all the data all the time and separate us from everyone else. If that's the kind of next generation algorithms and artificial intelligence that interests you, check out Brilliant. Brilliant is a really cool website and app that helps you learn about logic, algorithms, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, and more. Each of the courses starts out kind of easy and fun, and then gets more and more challenging as you master the concepts. It helps you build real knowledge by solving real problems. So what are you waiting for? Go to brilliant.org slash vector and get started today. Thanks Brilliant, and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. To me, arguing about whether or not Touch ID or Face ID are better, or if Touch ID is coming back, misses the point entirely. Touch ID isn't there for Touch ID's sake. Face ID isn't there for Face ID's sake. Both are attempts to solve the same problem, making security more convenient. And both were and are the best implementations of their respective times. But times change, and there are going to be faster, more transparent, and just plain better ways of solving the same problem in the future. It's not even a matter of if it will happen, it's simply a matter of when. When. And not to tie too neat a bow on it based on the video I did just two weeks ago, but if Apple is already able to help detect heart problems and falls with existing sensors and machine learning, just imagine the double duty this kind of technology could pull to not only keep us secure, but to keep us safe. At least that's what I think. Now, I'd love to know what you think. Are you happier with Touch ID or Face ID? And what kind of security systems do you want to see next? Hit like, hit subscribe. It really helps the video and the channel a lot. And then hit up the comments below and let me know. And thank you so much for watching.